1957, the American government got the shock of its life when the Russians launched the first ever space satellite, Sputnik. Determined never to be outwitted by the Soviets again, the Americans set up the Advanced Research Projects Agency, known as ARPA for short. ARPA was given a huge budget and told to go create something that would beat the Reds at their own game. Now, the Pentagon didn't have a clue what that was. They just wanted to protect America. ARPA wasn't your run-of-the-mill military R&D department focusing on the nuts and bolts of new weapons. It gathered together some of the brightest civilian scientists in America and told them to look far into the future to come up with something really revolutionary. One of the areas ARPA got stuck into was communications. Using the new technology of computers, it developed the ARPANET, a groundbreaking network and precursor of the Internet. By the early 1970s, ARPANET was one of several similar networks across the world. The problem was how to join them up. In 1974, two computer scientists, Vince Cerf and Bob Kahn, created the rules by which these networks could speak to each other. This marked the beginning of the global internet that we know today. The experience that we had at the beginning was simply solving a fairly tricky and interesting engineering problem. I don't think either of us appreciated that the solution to that problem would lead to what we have today, which is a global network of networks with over almost two billion people online. Underlying Vince Cerf's work was a technology called packet switching. It lies at the heart of the virtual revolution. Packet switching takes a piece of information and breaks it up into small pieces. These are then sent over a network, often not in the right order or even over the same line. At the receiver's end, the packets are recombined in the right order and the data is made whole again. Packet switching is the perfect tool for computers to talk to each other because it allows for a huge amount of data to be transmitted fast through multiple routes all at once. This architecture means an unstoppable flow of data and it's this that would have dramatic consequences for individuals and governments in the years that followed. Part of my motivation when I was working on the Internet was exactly to build a system that did not have any central control. Recall that this was being supported by the U.S. Defense Department. And one of the things the Defense Department wants is highly reliable and resilient systems. One way to achieve that is to not have any central place that could be attacked and destroyed and therefore interfere with the operation of the net. So the consequence of this decentralized architecture is that it is highly resilient to a variety of impairments. And in consequence of that, it would be very hard for anybody to shut the internet down entirely. When it started, the old ARPANET connected up four universities across America. The internet today links up a quarter of the population of the planet. The hubs of the internet are root servers. They work a bit like phone directories. They connect all of our computers to the websites that we want to see. It looks like an anonymous office block, but this building actually houses one of the 13 root servers that keep the internet flowing across the world. We have multiple doors of access, cameras in the ceiling, and then we have a lot of um, true floor to true ceiling walls that are solid construction so that you can't really go in very easily. The outsides of walls are all metal mesh. We also have motion sensors in our ceiling so that no one can even go through the drop ceiling and things like that. Well, basically what you're telling me is that what's in that room is extremely valuable and extremely important. Absolutely. All this security is here to protect the Holy of Holies, the inner sanctum of the server room. This room is responsible for all of the dot-com addresses in the world, 80 million of them. 
The smooth running of the world economy depends on it. That's actually a database server over there, so huge chunks of disk space. In its way, this room is probably as important as the Oval Office. Let's take a moment to listen to the sound of 80 million dot coms. What would happen if I pulled the plug, if suddenly there was a power outage here in Mountain View, California? Uh, so most of the data centers that you'll find have a bunch of redundancy in them. We ourselves have um, uninterruptible power supplies. We have diesel generators. Um, if, for example, our own root server were to go down, as I said, there's 12 other ones. And even if you were to attack, say, uh, one of these 13, those 13 are really a constellation of about 191 different other servers that are around there. So it's not even just attacking one of the 13, you really have to get out and go a whole, you know, collection of servers to get really what you're looking for. So it's not that easy to take down the internet. Individual countries like Iran can't shut it down even if they wanted to because it's a global shared system. An international body called ICANN that has no allegiance to any one country oversees the root servers, but its role is limited. ICANN, as this international entity, do they have the power to regulate? Do they have the power to turn the internet on and off? Um, you know, I don't know that anybody has the power to turn the internet on and off. It became more and more apparent that the internet's style of operation was the antithesis of what most countries had been accustomed to. In fact, in the early days of telephony and telegraphy, there was only one network, and it was often managed by and operated by the government, giving it substantial control. So I rather liked the idea that the Internet didn't have that, let me call it, deficiency, and therefore opened a platform up. It's probably the most democratic opportunity for people to express themselves and to get information than has ever existed. In the 20th century, if you had something to say in public, you couldn't. Period, right? If you were a civilian, if you were a citizen but not a media professional, you could not broadcast a message, no matter how hard you tried. In fact, people who went out of their way to try to get messages out in public through amateur channels, right? You know, holding up signs on the street or you know by the roadside, were widely regarded as being kind of off their rockers. And that change, that change is enormous. That anyone who wants to participate has at least the means to participate is a huge change. If you have a communication system that's unbreakable, with no central control, that can amplify a message, then information, which is already hugely powerful, becomes supercharged. In the right or the wrong hands, it takes on massive significance in battles against authority. Anonymous users can now perform the role of investigative journalists by publishing hard information and protecting primary sources. And nowhere is this new power more apparent than on a website called WikiLeaks. WikiLeaks allows people to anonymously blow the whistle on governments and corporations. The people who run it have made some pretty powerful enemies. No wonder they like to keep a low profile. The question of internet censorship has become one of the most central questions of our time. That will define on how societies all over the world will be able to freely communicate in the future. WikiLeaks has posted a membership list of the BNP, naming several teachers, doctors, and police officers. It's published the classified U.S. Army documents about Guantanamo Bay, revealing abuse of prisoners' rights. The contents of the American politician Sarah Palin's Yahoo email were put online, showing how she used her private account to evade public record laws. The publication of a report in 2008 detailed hundreds of assassinations by the Kenyan police. WikiLeaks has a database of over 1.2 million documents. It maintains its own servers at undisclosed locations, keeps no logs, 
and uses military-grade 